Hey fellow coders, welcome back to Game Dev with Tony. In today's video, we're going to switch things up by customizing the default mouse cursor. We'll learn how to replace it with a custom image, make it animated, and in the second half, we'll even add a cool sparkle trail effect. Let's dive in and get started. The assets for this project are up on my GitHub. The link is in the video description. We'll start with creating folders for the sprites. Create a parent folder called sprites, then inside it create three folders. Name them cursors, background, and sparkle. Import all the images to their respective folders. The cursor for this tutorial is a hand with a pointing finger. The cyan sprite will be used for our static cursor. All the images will have the same properties. Point no filter and no compression. When we run the scene, the default operating system cursor is used. The easiest way to set your custom cursor is through the project settings. Head up to the Edit menu and select Project Settings. In the Player section, you'll see a place for the default cursor. To the right, click on Select in the Texture 2D box. Apply the static cursor image. You may see a warning appear in the console about the texture need to be set to RGBA32, readable, have alpha transparency, and no MIP chain. We'll take care of fixing that next. There's a cursor hotspot field for X and Y coordinates. This is the point in the cursor that triggers the click interactions. For this cursor, it would be the tip of the finger in the top left. X of 0 and Y of 0 is what we'll use. If you had a crosshair cursor, for instance, then your hotspot may be in the center. And if your image is 32 by 32, then you'd use X of 15 and Y of 15. Visually, you can't see the hotspot here, so you may need to use an image editor to find the coordinate of the pixel. Testing our cursor now. You can see Unity is showing our blue hand pointer. OK, let's resolve the warning. Select all the cursor images and change the format option to RGBA 32-bit. Alpha is transparency should already be checked, but if not, do so. Also check the read-write option. No check for MIP maps. The warning should not appear if we run the scene again. Next we'll test our hotspot coordinates. To do that we'll add a UI button that we can click on. Right-click in the hierarchy and go to UI, Legacy, and Button. Increase the size for the width, height, and font. We can click the button and see that it responds, so the hotspot is working. If you try it with the corners of the fingertip, it's triggering at the 0, 0 location. That's how you use a custom cursor. The easiest way to change it is through the project settings, especially if you're only using one texture throughout your game. So what if you want to change your cursor on the fly while your game is running? Next, we'll learn how to do it through code. We don't need the UI anymore, so we'll disable that component. Create a new folder called Scripts, and add in a new C-sharp file named CursorScript1. Make a new game object and name it Scripts Object. Attach the cursor script to it and open the script in Visual Studio. This is the code for the cursor script. We create three public variables. The cursor texture is for our cursor image. Then a vector2 for our hotspot, this is the point where the mouse click will register. The cursor mode I'll explain shortly. In the start function, we make a call to the Unity function set cursor and pass it the texture, hotspot, and mode. Those public variables in the script are now available to us in the inspector. Assign the static cursor to the cursor texture field. The hotspot is already zero by zero. The cursor mode needs a little explaining. The auto option uses hardware cursors where supported. For software forces the cursor to be rendered using software. This could be useful when your custom cursor size or texture might be scaled unexpectedly with auto. Typically you want to use auto unless you have a non-standard size. The project cursors are 32 by 32 pixels. And we have our blue finger pointer. But to make sure the script is really working, we need to remove the texture from the project settings. Click on the cursor texture box and press the delete key on your keyboard. If we run the scene again, our custom cursor still works also with the UI button. For the next part of the project, we'll add in a background and a collider to trigger a cursor change. On the Scene tab, we can drag in a background image to automatically create a game object with it assigned to a sprite renderer. Zero out the transform and scale the image to 1.5 so it fills the camera view. Then rename the object to background. On the Scripts object, we'll add a Box Collider 2D component. Adjust the collider size and position, but to make it easier to see, we'll lower the alpha on the background temporarily. 
The green lines can be hard to see on bright colors. It doesn't have to be perfect, just as long as the collider covers the area where we want the cursor to change. We'll make some changes to the cursor script. Comment out the set cursor line in the start function. Add two new Unity functions, on mouse enter and on mouse exit. When our pointer enters the collider, on mouse enter is called. And when it leaves, on mouse exit. You can copy the set cursor code and paste it in both mouse functions. For the enter, there will be no changes. But on exit, change the first parameter to null. This will revert our cursor back to the system default. The cursor is back to the default pointer, but if we move it over the collider, it'll switch to the custom cursor, and if we move it outside of the collider, it'll go back to the default. Up to this point, it's been a single static cursor, but now comes the fun part. We're going to make an animated one. Create a new C -sharp file called Cursor Script 2 and attach it to the scripts object. Uncheck the first cursor script. Here is the code for our animated cursor. Included are the same three variables from the first script, but this time we make the cursor texture an array. We declare a public float named animation speed. This will be the time between each cursor change. The last two are privates, animation delay and animation index. The delay is a time counter, and the index is to track which cursor of the array we want to use. In the start function, we call set cursor like before, but index the texture. It's defaulted to zero, which will be the first element. Below in the update function, we perform the animation. The delay is incremented with delta time, and once it hits the speed value, the next frame index is calculated. The animation speed is subtracted from the delay variable to restart the counter. Set cursor is called to change the texture based on the index. Add seven elements to the cursor textures array and assign each animated cursor frame. We'll start with an animation speed delay of one tenth between each frame. And that's how to animate the cursor. That brings us to the end of the mouse cursors portion of the video. Now we'll add a sparkle effect to trail our cursor. I've modified the project a little off camera. I've made it so that when you click the cloud, an animation plays in the background. The code and the assets for everything will be in the project on my GitHub. Please also go into the assets folder and create a new folder called animations. The sparkle will drop along where the mouse cursor moves on screen on an interval, and after a fixed amount of time it'll disappear. Create a folder called prefabs. Create two new C -sharp scripts. Name them sparkle destroy and sparkle effect. Add a new game object to the hierarchy, call it sparkle. Reset the transform if needed. Attach the sparkle destroy script to it. Add an animator controller and a sprite renderer to sparkle. Assign the first frame of the sparkle animation to the sprite renderer. The sprite is very small, so you'll need to zoom in. We need to adjust the pivots on the sparkle images. The point should be in the top center. This is where the transform rotation and scale originate. It's also where our prefab will instantiate at, the top of the sparkle. Create an animator controller and an animation for the sparkle object. Name them both sparkle. Assign the animator controller to the sparkle object. Double click the animator controller and drag the animation into the animator window. We're almost done with the sparkle. Next we'll create its animation. Drag in all the frames and spread them out to the 30 mark. Make a prefab of sparkle by dragging the scene object into the prefabs folder. It's still too small, so we'll increase the object scale to 5 in the prefab. Run the scene again to check its size. We'll temporarily enable the animation to see it better. The sparkle will appear from the bottom right of the hand cursor. One last check in the prefab to make sure everything looks good. We can delete the sparkle object from the hierarchy. We'll code the scripts next, starting with the sparkle destroy. There is only one line of code in the start method. We destroy the sparkle after a slight delay after the animation finishes playing. The sparkle effect script is slightly more involved. A few public variables are created. The first is to the sparkle prefab, then the interval or the wait time between the sparkle objects being added to the scene. The offset is an adjustment to where it is spawned in relation to the mouse position. The last variable is a time counter like we used in other scripts. As before, the delay is incremented, and once the interval is reached, code for the sparkle magic runs. 
We capture the current mouse position and add the sparkle offset to it. This variable should really be called sparkle position because that's what it becomes. A copy of the prefab is instantiated. Its position is set to the value of the mouse position with the sparkle offset. Last, the delay is adjusted so the counter can start over. Attach the sparkle effects script to the script's object. Then assign the sparkle prefab to this field. Initially, we have a one second interval for the sparkle spawns. The offset has an X and Y of zero, so the sparkle is appearing at the hotspot position. Try some different offsets to see where the sparkle instantiates. You may notice that the positive Y numbers have the sparkle move vertically upward. This is because of Unity's screen coordinate space. The bottom left corner is 0, 0, and the top right is screen width and height. Knowing this, if we want our sparkle to move vertically down, we have to use a negative number. For this demo, the final coordinates will be x of 24 and y of negative 24. So the sparkle appears to the bottom right of the cursor hand. As for the interval, we can see the effect at one second, a half second, and one tenth of a second. The smaller interval has a better effect when the cursor moves whereas a larger value is more suited for the cursor not moving. Taking this into account will make changes to the sparkle effects script, so there are two intervals. You can compare the changes on screen to your sparkle script. Two intervals are defined. I named them one and two, but really should be fast and slow. The faster interval is number one, for when the mouse moves. And two vector threes to track the current and last mouse positions. In the start function, we do some initialization. Set the initial interval to the slow speed, get the current mouse position, and set it to both the current and last position vectors. Down in the update in the first script, we capture the mouse position in the if block, but now it's saved on each frame update. The rest of the block remains the same. After the if block, we check if the positions are different. If true, the mouse must have moved. We update the last position with the current and change the interval to the faster speed. But if both positions are the same, we maintain the slower speed so the sparkle doesn't spawn as frequently. Revise the intervals in the inspector. Set the first interval to 0.1 and the second to 1.0. Now the sparkle looks better based on the cursor's movement, or no movement. That wraps it up for this one. The project files are available on GitHub if you want to take a closer look or build on what we covered. If you found this helpful, consider giving it a like and subscribing so you don't miss future videos. This is Game Dev with Tony signing off. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.